Getting real in rural America. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, I am with a candidate for Congress who is testing the idea that a bold progressive message could work in rural America. Anthony Flaccavento is a second time candidate for Congress who is running in Virginia's ninth. It's a very large district with population sparse and spread out. I spent three days with Anthony in the run up to November's election. Here's how some of that played out. I'm a farmer and small business owner from Abingdon, so like you, I know hard work. For more than 30 years, I've been working with farmers, loggers, coal miners, school teachers, and community leaders to rebuild our economy, fix our problems, and fight for working people. It's what I call bottom-up solutions, and I've seen them work. In fact, I wrote a book about it, Building a Healthy Economy from the Bottom Up, which is full of examples from all around our region and the country. I sat down with Anthony um, last September and I said, what are you running for? What, what do you believe in? And he told me how he wrote this book and how he had all these great ideas and honestly, it was totally in line with what I thought needed to happen and the type of person that we need to run. We met Anthony in 2011 when we first moved to Abingdon, Virginia and started attending the farmer's market. Anthony had a lot to do with putting that farmer's market together. And so we've known him as a farmer for many years. Well, Anthony has been with us since the piston strike back in the probably the 90s. People in the coal fields were for him all along. Uh, when we finally got the OK from International, the endorsement was unanimous. The uh, Compact Committee endorsed him unanimously. Uh, you look around and you say, well, who, who really is considering the problems and listening to everybody uh, and trying to look for a, a reasoned solution? And uh, somebody who's been trying sustainable farming, uh, organic farming, who's been on the side of workers for the last few decades. Anthony is about as genuine of a candidate as one could hope for. I can tell he would be a statesman and not a politician. Anthony Flacavino is a great guy and we definitely need someone in Southwest Virginia who is about the people. It's time we have somebody up there that looks after the people here in Southwest Virginia. <laughs> oh, thank you, honey. Yeah, you take care. What do you love about this place, this land, this, this country, this, this county? Well, a lot of things. For one thing, you get out in the morning and you see these mountains. You have amazing sunrises. It's just the beauty is really quite incomparable. It's incredible. I simply love it. I love the physical nature of it. It kind of beats you up, but it also is really uh, very, very uh, fulfilling. It's wonderful to see the progress that you have from, you know, from tilling to planting to harvesting. So I love all of that. It's very tangible. Do you remember the decision or the thinking that went into why take a break from that life to, to make this run for Congress? Yeah, I really didn't want to, and, and maybe I could still say don't really want to take a break from this life. It's very fulfilling in a lot of different ways. It's a part of our livelihood, and along with the local economy work, they, they add up to, I think, you know, stuff that's very satisfying. But I also realized that they just weren't enough. I mean, the, the bottom line is that we're in a situation where the world is changing very rapidly, I'd say in most respects for the worse. And so part of it is that idea of stepping up to fight bad stuff. But the biggest motivation for me is stepping up to lift up this good stuff, of which my farm and my business are just one tiny dot among all these creative and effective upwellings of, of positive change. You're talking about a part of the world that in U.S. politics and punditry is seen as a, as a backwater. Absolutely. It's one of the most frustrating things. And that's, that's both sort of the so-called mainstream media and punditry. But to be perfectly honest, it's also our own party. It's my liberal peers in other parts of the country. They assume, generally about rural and specifically about Appalachia, they have a sort of, oh, those poor folks idea <laughs> at best. In fact, there's an amazing amount of innovation right here in Southwest Virginia, but also in Eastern Kentucky and Southern West Virginia and Southeastern Ohio. Just incredible things, like things that are not happening in some of the more populous and higher educated places. So doesn't and that make you furious? It, it does, yeah, it ticks me off totally, for sure. It, what really makes me angry is that after so many years of being in the midst of that and writing and speaking about it a lot, it's still the prevailing idea. You've done 94 town halls, yep. you're going to do 100. Yep. Um, what have you learned there, and, and what are you learning about these constituents of yours? Well, 
one thing I'd say is that those town halls have certainly included kind of traditional Democrats and liberal leaning people. And it's been so great to get that group excited. And they are really, really excited. And then on top of that, it's included a whole bunch of folks that have not been in the choir. And having this much broader base of people kind of confirms this idea that a message that is, again, based on fighting the rich and powerful and uplifting everyday people is a message that a whole bunch of people in, in rural America want. Like you all, I feel like our democracy is, is on thin ice, um, and a lot of people are suffering who need not be. Well, all of that is true. I also think that the way you do cross the aisle is definitely by talking, but also by delivering practical results that are kind of undeniably better for people at the community level. My name is Aiden, um, and you stated you support innovative manufacturers and seek to provide jobs for workers, specifically those who um, might have to leave coal factories because of downsizing, my father potentially being one of them. <coughs> Do you see the construction of the Appalachian Pipeline to be an opportunity for new jobs, naturally, natural resources, and in industry for these workers? The main reason I'm running is because in my 33 years down here, I've just met folks like you all, I've seen what you're willing to do, I've seen what's possible. And I'm willing to give up a few years of my life to fight to be a real representative for the 9th District and to say once and for all, enough with the rich and the powerful, they got plenty. I'm a working guy, I'm going to go there and fight for working people. And the state. This district, as you mentioned, is really big. Oh, yes. Yes. It's bigger than New Jersey? Yes. Um, and in fact, I think all of our cars have the mileage to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say in all of these town hall meetings has been the sort of top three items that have come up? No matter what, everywhere we go, we hear about health care. Outside of health care, a big one, um, and interestingly enough, age doesn't matter on this question, jobs in the economy, whether we're talking to people who are retired or people just starting in the workforce, Jobs in the economy is a big deal for a lot of different reasons, and they come from different perspectives when they're asking about it, but everyone wants to know how we're gonna get more jobs and more opportunities in the 9th District. Yeah. What have you learned about Southwest Virginia during this campaign? What surprised you? On this campaign, I really learned, okay, wow, all right, we're representing an area way larger than I ever thought possible, but also, that no matter how far you go, the people are extremely similar. Whether you're in the coal fields or whether you're in Blacksburg, people share the same ideas. They might just have a different personal experience. I'm a fifth generation farmer and grew up in the same house in Rich Valley, Virginia, which is uh, just uh, about 10 miles east of Saltville. We've been um, do practicing sustainable agriculture for almost 30 years now. I've been doing the rotational grazing and everything. Primarily, uh, what was what sold my father on it was uh, cost saving. Rotate grass and stockpile fescue for the winter and then divvy it out in the, in the winter time. You cut your hay costs and completely out. That gave rise to grass finished beef. So how did you first meet Anthony Flacavento? Um, dealing with the, the Abingdon Farmers Market. He, he was one of the biggest sellers and um, the market would probably not be here today as we know it without him. It was just a bunch of individuals selling their wares. He, he kind of helped bring us together. What difference does having that farmer's market make to a farmer like you? The cash flow is big because uh, normally you sell your yearlings and whatever call cows and two or three checks they may be big but they've got to last you the whole year That's right. and just having a weekly cash income really helped and anthony also uh, was instrumental in starting appalachian harvest mm -hmm. what does that do when anthony moved here this was big tobacco country a lot of tobacco now, now it's just not market forces and um, a great political, political forces ran t tobacco out. 
Anthony helped was instrumental in starting Appalachian Harvest that got them to grow organic and um, conventional produce. So the small farms could, could get a high return per acre that they needed to be viable. They could survive. Yeah, and they didn't have to become salesmen to do it. Yeah. Which is 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 it's hard to find somebody who's willing to be out there alone and work, and then come and be a salesman it's, too. It's a lot of jobs. So what do you think are his chances? I think they're a lot better than they were last time. Everybody has heard of Anthony, and everybody knows he will work. And the farmers are saying, we're not getting anything now. Why not try something else? Most people, when you say rural progressive, they're like, whoa, isn't that an oxymoron? And maybe it seems to be, but actually there's a tremendous amount of progressive thinking here in terms of thinking and doing that lifts up local poor people, working people, and levels the playing field between the powerful and the less powerful. When Democrats decided, you know, 10 years ago, when liberal groups and progressives decided to stop messing with rural America, you know, in everything from not just politics, but the think tanks and the activist groups that will, that will create a whole blueprint for progressive change and not even use the word rural in the entire thing. You know, that goes on long enough, people say like, maybe the Republicans are right. Maybe those people don't care about us. So turning that around is first of all, showing up. And secondly, listening when you show up. And then the third thing is taking some of the wisdom from here that maybe challenges some of the wisdom of liberals and progressives and creating a new way of working on this. What's this machine? What's this all about? I have black lung second stage. How do you think you got it? Working in the coal mines, eating dust, and I ran a miner uh, most of that time. How many people that have black lung get get help? And if not 100%, why not? The average, uh, 20% in the industry. So 20% of people who have black lung and make claims get accepted, their claims accepted. Yes, the, the fallacy is in the law. Most people that don't understand black lung laws, the law is only in place to, to enable you to, uh, to, to actually get the benefit, but you have to qualify for the benefit. It's not an, uh, an automatic, because you're in the mines 15 years and you've got black lung, whatever stage it is, that you qualify for benefits. That's a fallacy, you don't. And then you have to fight to get your benefits, employ lawyers, uh, get all the doctors on board. And then after you do all that and you win your claim, here comes the company. And you're in court and it constantly harassing you uh, with their doctors that they pay big salaries to say that there's something else that's causing you to have difficulty. It's not your black lung. And with Medicare for all, you wouldn't have to go through that. Well, I think, uh, I mean, I'm on Medicare right now. The thing that I find is uh, if I go to the doctor for anything to deal with my black lung, Medicare pays for it. So what does this part of the country need? What do, what do you want from a congressman or from Congress right now? We can't rely on coal in Appalachia to make a difference. Uh, it's on the way out. It's been on the way out since I started in the mines in the 70s. We as coal miners, I would say, I wonder if we could make it another year. Can we make it another year? They're saying we have 25 years. I put 38 in. So you can understand the psychology of the workplace worrying about if you're gonna have a job tomorrow. They don't want anybody to come into Southwest Virginia and take their place. Who wants to come into coal mines and to make $25 an hour? Who? Why would you not rather work in a, a industrial atmosphere that's clean, healthy, and all the things. So the only incentive is it's the highest paying employment in the area, and we want to keep it the highest paying employment in the area. So to me, that's a control. That's how you control your employees and you control the environment in the community. I believe Anthony can diversify. I believe Anthony can look outside the box and bring other things to, to the cold counties of uh, Southwest Virginia. How are you doing? How's it going so far? That's fantastic. How many days has it been? Yeah, a month and a day. Yeah, it's a month, month and a day. day. Yeah. Wow. I have the hope that being in Congress, 
I could both speak about these things in a way that would motivate people, but also pass legislation okay. that would change it. So I really, I really have no political aspirations. It's, it's really, for me, an extension of the work I've been doing at the local level for a little more than three decades. That makes me happy to hear. <laughs> yeah. The big question is, can we build an economy that's good for people without extracting and ruining the land that we ultimately depend on. That's the bottom line in everything, right? Do we want to build out infrastructure at many billions of dollars of cost for the old grid, for a grid based on extraction? Because not only is this gas passing through communities and posing risks and threats, but it's coming from fracked wells not too far from us in West Virginia and Pennsylvania where there's a lot of damage going on. And then ultimately between the fracking and the pipes, we're getting methane going out into the atmosphere that's contributing to climate change. So there's a lot of reasons not to continue to invest billions and billions of dollars in the infrastructure that enables that, but to take that money and invest it in the grid and the, and the energy sources that move us away from this kind of carbon dependence. If we try hard enough, we can usually find ways to put people to work with little or no harm to the community and the ecosystem. We just default to these projects where we're choosing between jobs and the environment. And that's this false choice that's been ruinous for so many places. We gotta find the alternative so we're not stuck with that false choice. Honestly, what makes this campaign different and our candidate different is the sense of family. Mm -hmm. All of our volunteers, even though we've got them spread out over such a large distance, they have access to Anthony if they want to talk to him. He's just a call or an email away. Some of the campaigns that I've seen before, a lot of times the people on your staff barely see your candidate. And in some campaigns, there are even sort of unspoken rules that the candidate doesn't talk to the staff. Like he only gets to talk to the upper level um, and that's just not the way we do things here. Um, because part of what we believe is that if we're going to be representing the people of the 9th District, they need to know who Anthony is on a personal level and they need to know each of the staff on a personal level. What would make it easier uh, for you as, as somebody who's field directing a campaign? I think there are a lot of things. Um, just from the top, I think we can't say that we want candidates like this to run and then give them no support. Um, what we see all over the country is that when we get good people to run, they're only given a chance after they prove they've already got the support. It's really a call for all the organizations out there, the party, everybody to take a real hard look at candidates and ask themselves, do we want this person to run? Do we want them to succeed and be serious about it? People are done feeling forgotten. They are finished with that. We're fighting back. We're putting the fight back in the fight in ninth, and, and our people are representing that. We had, what, we put up three or four signs, yeah. um, and we also had quite a few people. One lady who wasn't sure, and then as we and left, yeah. she said, I'm oh, voting for voting. you, yeah. Um, yeah. and several others who were saying That's that good. they were they were won over already. One even mentioned the, um, commercials. Ad, the commercials and said that they were really impressed with those. Fantastic. So, so you're heading back to give some more signs out? Uh, well, to knock on some more doors. doors. We've been leaving signs <laughs> as we went. Yeah. Yeah. How so, many signs have you gotten rid of this morning? I think four. 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 I think. Not yeah. bad. Yeah. 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 That's yeah, exciting. It's been a very positive experience. Yeah. 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 Well, it's time? not over yet. Yes, it is. So she's, she's, a, time, she's a virgin. So. She's a newbie. <laughs> <laughs> The whole area is very conservative. Um, I have lived there all my life and always just was a quiet liberal. And one of the joys of becoming involved in this campaign for the very first time is that I have uh, met more and more people who have finally come out as liberals or come out as Democrats. 
Uh, and so it is a conservative area with a lovely group of liberals who are finally coming out as progressives or liberals. I personally came into the campaign uh, because of gun violence in the schools. Yeah. That was the thing that, uh, that I just could not take it anymore, and Congress just kept on doing nothing uh, about it. And so that was what led me to my first Democratic meeting. Um, I have not been politically active um, like uh, Meredith has in an open way. Um, and so that, I was really, uh, that was something that really uh, upset me very much. The thing that most attracted me about Anthony and the campaign is uh, more around a general thing about his integrity and his honesty and, you know, uh, the fact that his willingness to listen to people and really take in Treva's issues and, you know, my issues and everyone's, um, you know, input about what's important to us here in the Ninth District. So I certainly um, agree with economic issues, um, you know, building our communities um, from the ground up. I think that's a, a very important issue where I live in Floyd and Reiner. I think we're going to see uh, all our Democrats turn out. I think we're going to see all our independents and progressives and people who sat out the 2016 election pouring out of their homes and houses and uh, going to the polls this time. And I think it's both because of what has happened since 2016, but mm -hmm. also uh, the fact that Anthony has done, uh, you know, by the end of this, he will have done 100 town halls. He will have talked to thousands and thousands of people across the Ninth District. Um, I, I always tell folks that in the first two months, just in Floyd County, he had talked to more people than Morgan Griffith has in eight years. Um, I think that's going to pay off. What would make it easier for people like you to run? Because you, in a way, you're kind of downplaying just how tough this job is. One of the biggest problems, I think, is how much money there is in politics. So there's not a level playing field in terms of getting your ideas out there to normal people and so forth. More support from perhaps the Democratic Party so that, you know, you're starting off as a new politician and you don't really know all the ropes. If he could have had a little help with some how you do this, what, here's what you should do, you know, I mean, it's just, it's been a real learning curve. Publicly funded elections would make an enormous difference. Yeah. If simply if you did not have to either be rich yourself, which many people running for Senate and Congress are, uh, if you want to be a working person who has to do without income for a full year, as I've basically done, as we've done, um, having publicly funded elections, some sort of system where uh, people would qualify for public support to match local donors would make an enormous difference because fundraising is the single biggest burden. The rest of it, the organizing of the town halls, the development of cores of volunteers that cut across the spectrum, that to me has been the fun part and that I think is actually kind of a pretty effective grassroots model that we have to offer to other campaigns. What's your message to other people who, who look at this both the, the, the need and the challenges and they're trying to figure out the calculus. We're planning to win, we think we're gonna win. If we don't win, the legacy of this campaign, I hope, will be first of all, a much more energized and diverse political base in Southwest Virginia. I think there's gonna be a surprise on election day. We just saw it in New York where a very powerful candidate, not unlike yours, been in office for a long time, thought nobody was gonna challenge him ever, had no fear of a grassroots candidate and found himself ousted by a 28-year-old first-timer who ran as a democratic socialist with a very similar campaign to yours. So let's assume for a minute that that happens. Um, then what's your message? First, quit giving up on rural communities. Not only the Democratic Party, but the, lar the larger sort of liberal establishment. Quit that nonsense and start putting time and energy into those communities, even if it means a little bit of trade-offs in terms of where you spend on the money. Second, stop assuming that the only people who can win in rural areas are people who essentially are Republican light. Uh, I'm not Republican light. And have a bold message that speaks directly to people who are struggling and suffering. That, that's what people want to hear. That's what I'm about. That's why I'm saying it. But that's, I think those are the two biggest things. And then the third thing is uh, don't pay too much attention to the political consultants. <laughs> Focus on what you know from experience works.
So as I headed off to Southwest Virginia to report this story, I have to admit, I wondered if I was going in the wrong direction. The nation's eyes at the time were all on the Kavanaugh hearings. A whole lot of my women friends were in Washington, D.C., protesting the Supreme Court nomination. And I was in a remote part of rural America with a congressional campaign that big donors and D.C. Democrats didn't seem to care that much about. And yet, I have to say that as soon as I set foot in the 9th District, I knew I was in exactly the right place. I've known Flacavento for years on account of his work for bottom-up economics. Our paths first crossed in the 1980s during the historic strike at Pittston Coal. And I'd interviewed him a few times about his work with Appalachian Sustainable Development, the nonprofit that helps family farmers. The longer I was in Virginia, the clearer things became. All the key players in the Kavanaugh drama hail from rural America, from Judiciary Committee Chair Grassley to Senate Leader Mitch McConnell to turncoat Democrat Joe Manchin of West Virginia. Having more real rural progressives in Congress could fundamentally change this country's politics. But running's not easy. Flack has a fighting chance in what they call the fighting ninth. And a win like his could be a tipping point. But the point of this story is really to say that it could be made a whole lot easier if people in Washington and the media stopped writing off rural changemakers. The sentiment I heard again and again from Virginia progressives was that they were fed up with being underestimated.